Uh, thanks for talking to me, Phil. So, uh, give us a, a brief sort of overview about what your thylacine research involves. So I'm really just trying to look at the different conservation values uh, that species that may or may not exist have uh, because to me it doesn't really seem logical to spend a lot of time and energy arguing about whether it's uh, in a habitat or not. Uh, that energy could be used to conserve the habitat and if it is in there, great, then you've conserved uh, you know, an endangered species uh, habitat. And if it's not in there, well, you've not lost nothing because you're conserving the habitat for all of the other biodiversity. And as you know, we're in a global biodiversity crisis. Uh, so anything that helps conservation and the biodiversity cause at the moment uh, is a good thing. And I, I see very much uh, thylacine uh, as an icon species that may or may not be out there supporting the conservation cause in that way. Fantastic. So in terms of an outcome, you're looking at what effect the hunt for the thylacine can have on conservation or...? Uh, yeah, um, th it's more about how accepting that different belief systems can coexist as long as they're serving a, a common purpose. Uh, and one of the analogies I, I like to make is with the um, Aboriginal people uh, who have a cosmology that includes a very uh, diverse set of beings, including, for example, bunyips. Uh, and we conserve uh, wetlands because they're bunyip habitat and they have cultural heritage value. And uh, by extension, if there is a potential that a thylacine exists in an area or people believe that it does exist in an area, there's no reason that that can't be used as a, an advocacy tool for conserving that environment in exactly the same way. Many conservation initiatives around the world depend completely on collaborations between Western trained conservation biologists and uh, local indigenous often people with other belief systems collaborating for a, a common cause. So it's no, absolutely not an unusual situation for different belief systems to work together uh, to conserve an environment that has both biodiversity and cultural and heritage uh, value. And I, I see uh, the thylacine uh, initiative, what Tagoa is doing for example, as very much fitting uh, that model. You know, so there's a recent modeling paper, for example, from uh, Tasmania that shows that there is a, you know, a very small but finite chance that populations of thylacines may survive in the wilderness pockets, remote areas uh, of Tasmania. Uh, and if that's the case, it's worth preserving that habitat because you'd have an incredibly rare and you know, extremely endangered uh, species in there. And if they don't exist, then nothing has been lost at all. You're conserving the habitat for all of the other biodiversity and heritage value uh, that is in that environment. So uh, if those um, forces can uh, work together uh, in the interest of conservation, I see that as a very uh, positive thing and groups like Tagoa can contribute to that. Any comments on to go uh, at the moment and what, what your th uh, initial thoughts have been around to go and the work that they're doing? I think there's a lot of uh, different groups who are interested in uh, cryptic species. Uh, some of those are more mythological. Uh, some of them have you know, scientific evidence that they have existed in the past. Uh, and what particularly excites me is a lot of the Lazarus species. So the species that are thought to have been extinct that are then rediscovered. Uh, and there are many historical examples of that and some very recent ones, including the you know, night parrot, which is you know, another icon species of uh, conservation. And you know, it would be lovely to think that the thylacine might fall into that category. And even if it doesn't, uh, the pursuit of it gives a lot of people uh, hope and a conservation uh, drive to help preserve those sorts of environments that are so important for all biodiversity. How did it feel yesterday standing where, with Mark, where there's been a solid, a very solid sighting of a thylacine? Oh, that was amazing because you know you drive past these places and you think, yeah, nah, nothing could live in there. And when you're standing in it and you know that somebody's seen one, you say there's actually a lot of hiding places, a lot of prey items, uh, a lot of dens. 
uh, when you're actually on the ground, you see a lot of stuff that you don't when you're, you know, reading or talking about stuff. So it's really worth getting in the field. And it's nice to know when we're out in the field here, we're not going to be shot at. That's right. We had a, an amusing incident uh, with a friendly farmer uh, yesterday, uh, and we, you know, just talking about what we were doing and why we were out there. And he volunteered the fact that he would not shoot us. We thought that was very helpful of him. It's always a bonus when you don't get shot at. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what's the time frame on your research? Have you got sort of time goals attached to it or? Yeah, look, unfortunately in uh, the academic environment at the moment, there's uh, a lot of time and financial pressure uh, on everything. Uh, so the sooner uh, I can write some of this material up and get some papers out uh, that sort of legitimizes in the uh, academic world uh, what I'm doing uh, but there'll always be more you know there'll always be that frustration of trying to understand more or discover more or help more and uh, you know I guess I'll just have to balance that as best I can as the work develops. You're very open-minded Phil do you have a, a personal view on whether you think the thylacine's out there? Well, uh, I guess as a scientist, I need to have an open mind because we should always be open to new evidence. Uh, and I, I am. I haven't seen one. Uh, I know other people have, and I'd very much like to see one. Uh, if I did, I would definitely be a much firmer believer. Uh, but I'm certainly open to new evidence, as I think uh, any good scientist should be. There's a universal pressure in academia to get publications out. That's like, you know, the currency. Uh, and there'll be a range of outcomes probably from this uh, work. Uh, some in uh, scientific journals that uh, explain, you know, conservation initiatives and how different groups can support that conservation type publications uh, and others more in the anthropology uh, side how different belief systems arise and why it's important to understand and accept variety uh, as we've discussed. <laughs> it would be really good to be able to go to Tasmania uh, and talk to some of the people who have uh, had sightings there and look at some of the habitat because of course that was the mainstay uh, of uh, thylacine since uh, European times and if uh, populations still exist, that's probably the most likely place. Uh, so it would be nice to at least get a bit of a feel for that habitat and the people who are involved in seeing them there. But uh, travel is obviously a little bit precarious at the moment, it has been for the last couple of years. Uh, so that's a little bit of a frustration uh, in my research. Uh, but uh, fortunately, there are enough Tagoa members in South Australia to still have an interesting and productive time, I hope.